in those companies. And when we dig into it, and we see that the government is giving special ministerial zoning orders for Southbridge to expand and rebuild Orchard Villa in Pickering, or to rebuild in Port Hope, or to rebuild in Ottawa, and all the other city councils that are voting against those developments, I know that the same kind of corruption that permeates the Greenbelt deals will be found in these private health care contracts worth billions of dollars everywhere. But that will be too late. So we're here today and I'm saying I see not even half of the buses are in. There's accidents on the 400, so people are coming in late, but the park is filling up, which means there's somewhere close to 5,000 people here now. We wanted to come as patients, as doctors, as nurses and health professionals, as healthcare frontline workers and PSWs, support workers, the whole healthcare team, as seniors and users of services, as communities where your emergency departments are under the risk of permanent closure or have been closed down and now we need to fight to reopen them. We're here together to send the strongest possible message. Doug Ford, hands off our public health care. I'm going to close with this. They are driving the public health care system into the ground. We've had 500 emergency department closures in Ontario since the beginning of the year. It's unheard of. We've never seen anything like this in the history of Ontario. Every ICU is working short. The nurse shor shortage of nurses. Every hospital has a shortage of health professionals. Every long-term care home practically is working understaffed. There's not enough staff to even provide home care anymore. There is an emergency the like of which we have never seen in Ontario's health care system. You would think that this government would spend all the money that we have budgeted on health care. But actually, they underspent the health care budget by more than a billion dollars last year. And they're on track to doing the same this year. It's not about money. In truth, it's not about money. Ontario funds our health care at the lowest rate of any province in the country. It's a plan. It's a plan to underfund the system. Why do we see nothing from the health minister, nothing from the premier on the staffing shortage? Why are they not on TV calling back the recently retired staff, begging them to come back, clearing the way, offering incentives for them to do so? Why would they impose wage restraints in the middle of the worst staffing crisis we've ever seen in our lives? If it wasn't incompetence, then the only explanation can be that it is purposeful to create a, a crisis in the public system and hand it over to private for profit interests. It sounds conspiratorial, but the truth is they've increased the funding for private for profit clinics by literally hundreds of millions of dollars over the last two years. They've increased the funding for private for profit nursing agencies and health professionals agencies by hundreds of millions of dollars. While we're underspending in the public system, they're shunting hundreds of millions over to privatizing. It's a plan. And unless Ontarians stand up, we're going to lose what we've spent 100 years building in this province. And I tell you, for one, I won't let it happen. And you won't let it happen.
Sergio, come on over. enough nurses, they are short-staffed, there is not enough care provided, and we have a lot of for-profit agency nurses coming into our healthcare system and not providing the best care that is available. And as someone who has been in that ICU for 12 years on and off, that they are family and they have started to leave because of burnout. And by 12 o'clock during the day, the charge nurse is going around and saying, can anyone stay till 11 after your 12-hour shift? And that's not okay. We should not be having so much issues with that. We need a lot more support. And it is also not safe in that ICU either, or in any ICU as of right now, because what happens is it used to be one-on-one -on -one care because the ICU is full of the sickest patients in the hospital and they do not have that ability. So now if the nursing ratio is either two to one or three to one and a nurse wants a break, that makes it six to one and that is not acceptable at all. And so, our healthcare that is failing and this for profit that Doug Ford wants to do is definitely not anything that is going to make it better. I have seen the decline of our hospitals all over the last 12 years. We have been, the hospitals have been short stopped for 15, 20 years now, but nothing has been done about it. And it's one of the things that as a patient, it gets scary sometimes being in there and not knowing if there's going to be an emergency or if you're in a crisis. If there's going to be a nurse right there at the time you're needed or the respiratory therapist or a PSW. And these are things that is going to get extremely 
limited and extremely worse if we privatize healthcare and privatization is not the answer. We have seen what privatization did to home care. We saw what happened with that, and it is a failure as well. So our hospitals are failing. Uh, I ran as a candidate in the provincial election last year for the NDP. In, in Lanark, not that case. And what has happened this year and this summer, emergency rooms were closed in the Sioux Falls. Airport, leading to no hospitals open for emergency care between Kingston and Ottawa. And that's not acceptable. It is time to stop Doug Ford and the Conservatives on this privatization of our healthcare system because it's already decimated and if it goes any further, it's going to get worse by the day. And if I would have been an American citizen when I had my accident, I wouldn't have been able to afford to be alive today, and I probably would not be alive today. So it is our public health care system that has allowed me to continue to live my life and not let me stop living life on a daily basis. So it's time to stop. Doug Ford, the Conservatives, and this privatization of health care because if we don't, we're not going to be able to afford going to the doctor going and getting the help we need. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much, Drew. Thank you very much. Okay, in just a minute, we're going to get our health professionals up here who are going to do the chants. Um, so you can uh, let, uh, let Drew come down and then make your way up. And in the meantime, I'm going to introduce you to Judith, Nor Judith Norris. And Judith works at the Income uh, Security Advocacy Centre. Um, uh, but she has a personal story about private health care. Go ahead. So I'm the medical advocate for my brother, um, who's on uh, dis disability. And last year, his vision uh, was getting bad. So we went to an opt uh, optometrist to get his eyes tested. I know, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> to get his eyes tested. And we found out that he has cataracts and possibly glaucoma. So, we're sent to a specialist. We think it's publicly funded. We go to the center. Um, he gets his eyes tested. Yes, he does have cataracts. Yes, he does have to have surgery to remove the cataracts and get new lenses placed. And at this point, he's told that he has to pay $1,500 per eye while he's on ODSP. So, he can't pay that. I can't pay that. So we said, yeah, I don't know how we're going to do this surgery because, yeah, we can't afford that. Well, OHIP will cover um, your lenses being, traced, uh, being replaced, but it'll only be the sedan of lenses. It won't be the Rolls Royce, which is the $1,300 per eye. So we agreed to that, what OHIP will cover, because we can't afford $13 per eye. Um, and they then tell us that they need to take his eye measurements. And there's two tests, one that OHIP will cover, which is only 60 to 80% accurate, or the test that will actually get the lenses correct in his eye, which is 70 to 90% correct. So of course we want the, the latter. So yeah, the latter is better, but uh, it's gonna be $350, please. It, but I'm working, 
So I say, okay, fine, I'll pay for it. So I pay it. And then they tell us, do you want to have the surgery in the clinic or do you want to have the surgery at a hospital, which OHIP will pay for, but could take a year before he gets his vision repaired, or we can do it in the next two weeks um, at the private clinic, but you'll have to pay for it. We said, you know what, we'll wait. Uh, he can't see now, it is what it is. We'll wait until we can get access to a hospital to have his eye surgery done. And funny enough, this happened in October of last year, and all of a sudden the hospital opened up in November and he had the surgery in November. So, if he went by himself, he would not have had his cataract surgery because he couldn't afford anything and he would believe that it's necessary to do everything they're telling him to do. So, this is what privatization of healthcare does for people, one, who don't know the medical jargon and doesn't know what's an upsell and is believing that to improve their health, they have to pay out of pocket. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. So just to be clear, if you go for cataract surgery, everything you need is covered by OHIP. When they tell you that it's for laser cataract surgery you have to pay, it's a lie. Laser cataract surgery is covered by OHIP. When they tell you you need an extra eye measurement test, you do not. The only needed eye measurement test is covered by OHIP. That is the law, and they cannot extra bill you for it. And if you've been extra billed for it or manipulated or upsold in the way that Judith is describing, which is routine practice at the private clinics, then come to us because next month we're going to make a major complaint to the federal government for the Ontario government violating the Canada. for their medical procedure or upsold manipulatively gets their money back. And so that's what's coming next. And this is Dr. Raghu Venugopal. Thank you to the Ontario Health Coalition, which has brought us all here today to Queen's Park. Premier Ford, Premier Ford, if you can see the people here today, we have a simple message for you. I am a Toronto emergency doctor, and I'm proud to work in the province of Ontario, but we have a simple message for the Premier of Ontario. It is time. It is time to put the health of the many above the wealth of the few. <laughs> Premier Ford, Deputy Premier Jones, it is time to put the health of the many above the wealth of the few. We are here. We are here as nurses, doctors, PSWs, and patients to say no to the privatization happening step by step in our beloved province. I am here today as a physician to attest to you that in my clinical practice in three hospitals, many of my patients cannot afford their basic medications for important diseases like diabetes. And what happens, ladies and gentlemen, you know what happens. If they can't afford their medicines, they end up in the emergency room or in the intensive care unit critically ill. The reality is, the truth is, that Ontarians cannot pay for Doug Ford's privatization of our health care system. The reality is, and, and all the powerful unions know this here today, that our hospital budgets are being gutted by for-profit, shareholder interest companies that are gouging hospitals for precious nurses that we need. The reality is when you come to an emergency room where I work, the nurses are carrying 10 to 15 patients each, which is a dangerous ratio. 
The reality, Premier Ford, is that hospitals and nurses can wait no longer for assistance, and they cannot further encumbered by your privatization efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality in Ontario emergency rooms today is that patients are waiting six hours or more to see a doctor. And, and you know this, when patients do get to see a doctor, they sometimes, and I attest to you, they wait 40 hours in a chair waiting for the medical care that they are entitled to. My message is, Premier Ford, Ontarians cannot wait any longer for your privatization efforts to have an effect, and we have to change the situation now. On these, on these hallowed grounds, on these public lands, we are surrounded by hospitals to the east, to the west, to the north and to the south, and I have the privilege to work in some of them. But those operating rooms at Mount Sinai Hospital, at SickKids, at Toronto General, at Women's College, at Toronto Western, at St. Joseph's, at St. Michael's, at Sunnybrook, those operating rooms are closed, are shut, are non-functional. Mr. Ford, they are closed in the evening. They are closed on the weekend. They are closed at night when our surgeons, our nurses, our staff, our PSLBs are ready and willing to work if the Premier will fund our publicly funded health care system. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come today as nurses, as unions, as patients, as providers to say one simple message. Of Ontario, it is time to put the health of the many ahead of the wealth of the few. Thank you, Dr. Benagopal. And here is Morris Beckford from the Neighborhood Group. Hello, everybody. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. We're going to send you a message. How are you doing? more like it. If you're going to send a message to, send a message to a loud bully, you've got to make sure that you do the same thing. Be loud. So how are you doing? There you go. As Natalie said, my name is Morris Beckford. I'm the VP EDI in Poverty Reduction at the Neighborhood Group. And I tell you my title because poverty reduction. If we lose health care in this province, reducing poverty or eliminating poverty is impossible. If we lose health care in this province, we will never get rid of poverty. Shame. I, you know, there, you don't really appreciate our health care system until you have your own health crisis. And in 2021, in the middle of the pandemic, I had my own health care crisis. My pandemic, my, um, my appendix, ruptured. It felt like a pandemic, I tell you. And I was in the hospital on a Thursday, and by Sunday I was out almost as good as new. I had the best care I'd ever had in my life. But what's more important, at least for me anyhow, is that I paid $45. I'm a researcher by heart. I'm a researcher by trade. So I went home and I looked up how much it would cost, how much it would have cost me to get my appendix fixed if I was in a country, if I was in the province, if I was in the state, you should know what I mean, if I didn't have public health care. It would have cost 40 to 60,000 Canadian dollars to get me fixed up. I would have died for it. I would have either died or my family would have to max out every credit card and all their savings to save my life. We are in a province where we've got this wonderful thing. We're in a country where we've got this wonderful thing that we have to protect. We have to do everything possible to make sure that we are protecting public health care in this province. We need to send a message to everybody in here, not just the Ford government, to everybody in here that their job is to protect public health care. Their number one job is to protect public health care. Before I go, I want you to do me a 
favor because I really would love to hear 5,000 people chanting and sending a message to Dougie that it is time to protect public health care. So we are going to start with stop privatization. Stop privatization. Stop privatization. Can I hear you? Come on. Stop privatization. One more time. Stop privatization. Yes. Stop privatization. Come on, one more time. Stop privatization. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Okay, and as the NDP comes up, we have the health professionals from across Ontario who are on the front lines of being privatized if this goes through and they're going to lead the chance for us today. So you guys turn and the NDP is coming onto the stage. Come on up. All right. So we don't want competition in health care, but there's nothing wrong with a little healthy competition with a bunch of defenders of public health care. So on this side, I want to hear Ford's corruption. Ford corruption. And this Inside. 
shareholders who are insider friends of this Conservative government. We know that this is a government that is spiraling out of control, lurching from scandal to scandal and crisis to crisis, and they're going to try to divvy up the spoils on the way out, but we're not going to let them. Stephanie Bowman, and Catherine McGarry, who happens to be a nurse. So, um, pardon my shameless plug, I am the son of a nurse. My, uh, my mother Mary served for 35 years at NDMC serving veterans. So I know something about what healthcare workers go through and how committed you are to the people we care for most. And we're grateful for that. And I also know that nurses, nurses, PSWs, technicians, you all do everything that you can for your patients. And the risk of moral injury because of what's going on right now and not being able to do all the things you want to do is something that concerns all of us. I can't do much to fix that right now. We're working hard at that. But I want you to know we know that it's happening and we thank you for it. What you witnessed this morning in question period, there was a lot of talk about the Green Bill and that $8.3 billion backroom deal that the Premier was making up for his friends and donors and fundraisers. That's wrong. That's totally wrong. 
here's the thing. It's not about the Greenbelt. It's about the Premier's way of doing business. And the thing that he's doing to the Greenbelt is what he wants to do to health care in this province. No way! No Whether that be for-profit clinics, temporary nursing agencies, you name it. Doug Ford will do whatever he can to benefit his friends and fundraisers and insiders, and we all have to do what we can to put a stop to it, just like we did in the Greenbelt. And I'm just going to close off again by thanking you all for everything that you do. We are all so lucky in this province. We've built a health care system that's one of the best in the world. It has its challenges. But we have to protect it. We have to protect it. And you have my commitment, our caucus's commitment, all of our party's commitment. We'll work with anybody and everybody to make sure that we have a strong, publicly funded health care system in this province that we can all continue to be proud of. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you very much. And we will work with anyone who will fight to protect our publicly funded, publicly delivered healthcare system as well. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to wait, welcome Mike Schreiner, who is the leader of the Green Party. Mike. This is what people power looks like. This is what union power looks like. It was people power, it was union power, it was all of us coming together that told Doug Ford to not sell off our green belt. And this is what it's going to take to tell Doug Ford not to sell off our health care system. We need a premier who's going to stand up for ordinary Ontarians. The same wealthy, well-connected Ford insiders who are going to get $8.3 billion in windfall, Greenbelt profits, it's the same kind of Ford-connected insiders who want to profit on the backs of nurses, frontline healthcare workers, patients, and people across this province. Ontario Health Coalition for bringing us together today. I want to thank all the unions and organizers. I want to thank everybody who is developing this movement all across the province. And I want to say I'm with you. The Ontario Greens are with you. We're going to work across party lines to tell Doug Ford to keep his greedy hands off of our health care system. Thank you, everyone.
we have not forgotten the thousands of long-term care residents who died during the pandemic, three quarters of those in for-profit long-term care facilities. We have not forgotten that they died without their families, died of neglect, of malnutrition, of dehydration, while their caregivers wore garbage bags with surgical masks for protection. Shareholders took hundreds of millions of dollars in profits as the Canadian Armed Forces tried to provide care in the worst homes. And we have not forgotten that this government, this Conservative government, has now awarded even the worst villains in that tragedy 35 year contract extensions. And that most of the new beds in long-term care have gone to for-profit operators. And we know that this government has an ideological commitment to for-profit care, despite the tragedies that unfolded in COVID. And so they have defunded, they're choking the Ontario hospital system of funding at a time when it has the fewest beds of any system anywhere in a developed economy in the world. And 170,000 people wait on surgical waiting lists. 17,000 of those children, 2,400 of them died last year waiting for their surgeries. 9,000 died waiting for MRIs and CAT scans. 1,291 languished on stretchers in hallways today as we speak. And this government funds the hospitals at 0.5% this year, while it gives a 212% increase to the private operators running for-profit cataracts and for-profit measles. And even though the death rates are higher, and even though the health care outcomes are worse, and even though these facilities steal staff, in Ottawa offering twice as much for nurses and clerical staff to work in the for-profit surgeries. Even though they're much more expensive, this government is committed to for-profit care. And we're here today to say we will take this fight to every village, every hamlet, every community in Ontario. We will fight until we win. And we're not just going to be satisfied 
them stopping private hospitals. We're going to demand they pay workers what they deserve.
work to do. We got a lot of work to do. But do you know how we got public health care in the first place? We fought. A lot of work. And it's up to all of us in this hall, in this space, in this community, across the labor movement, to make sure that we're not just protecting public health care, but that we're building public health care for the next generation of workers and residents and citizens in this country. And this government or no government across this country gets to take it away from us. Not without a fight, not without everything that we will have to do to make sure that we're keeping public health care right now. members in health care, from hospitals to retirement homes to ambulance services. We're doing it all out there. They have been doing it all. They got us through a goddamn pandemic. And what did they get for it? Bill 124. Shame is right. Shame is right. So we have to send a message today and every day. We're not going to stop fighting. We're not going to stop organizing. We're not going to stop until we win. Until we win. And I want to thank all the health care workers, all of them. Uniform peeps are close to my heart because I get to see them a lot. But I got to tell you, this world does not work without you. This world does not work without you. And now I'm going to turn things over to our brand new Ontario Regional Director, Sammy Ahashi.
rehash it for all of you because that's why we're here today. But the worst part of all of this is the privatization of our health care system. And as a nurse, there is nothing worse. It's bad. Bad. It's putting lives at risk. It leads to worse outcomes. It could lead to death. And we're not going to stand for it. No, we're not. In fact, for profit care has created a two tier system already in Ontario. For profit. Shame. and when to treat them. That's a shame. shame. And that means for profit bosses can turn people away when they have complex issues that they don't want to take the time to treat. And that's a shame. shame. There are privately run clinics right now at the Ottawa Hospital using our public funds, our public hospitals to fund private profiteers and that is a shame. shame. And that's not The cherry on top, private health care clinics are all over Ontario trying to make a buck on Ontarians and we're not going to stand for it. The care that patients should receive should never be driven by shareholders and this is precisely what's occurring. Stand up. Stand up Ontario. So what public health care is under attack, what do we do? So I'm running out of time here. That's, I'm getting the hook. So look back at what the Ontario Health Coalition has done. 98% of hundreds of thousands of Ontarians said no to Doug Ford's plan. 98%. No. Clearly Ontarians don't like this any more than nurses and healthcare professionals. So here's a message for Doug Ford, and I want you with me so he can hear us. We are all here. We are all united. And we are standing proud and speaking out against this. And we will not back down. We won't 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 back down. Okay. Thank you. You're angry. So we have two. Two other angry speakers that's coming up, Tyler Downey and Krista Hansa from Thunder Bay Region. If you're tired of Doug Ford's privatization plan, say yeah. yeah. If you think Doug Ford should resign right now, say hell yeah. Hell yeah. If you're ready to roll up your sleeves and organize across this problem, you're damn right. damn right. We've got to continue to keep this fight up. We've got to continue to organize. It's a great day of solidarity today. On behalf of SEIU, Healthcare Union, 60,000 workers strong in this province of Ontario, we stand in solidarity with you all. I have the honor of introducing the speaker that's going to represent our local today, Krista Hansen, all the way from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Now, I, I, I know you can do better than that. She's a little shy, so let's give her a warm welcome in. Come on now. Krista Hansen, everyone. Thank you, Tyler. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Krista Hansen. I am a rehab assistant at Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center. I am standing here today to warn the Ontario government and the people of this province about the threats of privatizing our Ontario hospitals. In Thunder Bay and across Ontario, we are already in the worst healthcare crisis we've ever seen. Long-time staff are leaving because of low wages, short staffing, and difficult working conditions. Shame. The Ford government has neglected health care workers for far too long. Now we're burning out and leaving for other industries because we can't afford to stay financially or mentally. 
This staffing crisis, in addition to a lack of government financial resources for our public health care services, has seen patient wait times skyrocket. In my department at Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre, we have people calling daily asking if we have any space available for OHIP funded services. So you can imagine what that does from an outpatient perspective in a hospital setting. Wait times matter and every wait list is backed up. We've seen what happens when people of Ontario are left to wait for urgent, potentially life-saving treatments like MRIs, CT scans and surgeries. 11,000 people have died already this year just waiting. Right now, our public health care system is failing. But the solution is in privatization. That will just make things worse. Instead, the Ford government put, needs to put our public tax dollars instead of the Ford government putting our public tax dollars into private corporations and shareholders' pockets, they must increase funding to the public health care services we've always relied on. And instead of hoarding over $22 million, the Ford government needs to invest in public health care and invest in health care workers. That includes increased wages and improved working conditions for frontline staff. Investing in frontline staff results in shorter wait times and improved care for the people of Ontario. homes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's not make the same mistakes in our Ontario hospitals. Thank you. Medically needed hospital and physician care. 
What that means is that when you go for cataract surgery, or you have hip surgery, or you go for an MRI or a CT scan, they cannot charge you an extra fee that you have to pay out of pocket. It means our needed health care must be covered by OHIP. It means it is illegal for our private clinic to charge a patient, and it is contrary to the law for the Ford government to allow them to do so. The principle is equity, that health care will be provided to all Canadians based on our medical need, not our wealth. It's about compassion, because before public Medicare, people suffered and people died without the needed care. Justice Emmett Hall led the Royal Commission on the Health Services in Canada. He interviewed hundreds of witnesses and brought attention to the needs of ordinary men and women living with injury and illness. He said, as a society, we are aware that the trauma of illness, the pain of injury, the slow decline to death are burdens enough for the human beings to bear without the added burden of medical or hospital bills, penalizing the patient at their moment of vulnerability. The Canadian people determined that they should band together to pay medical bills and hospital bills when they are well and income earning. Health services are a fundamental need, like education, which Canadians could meet collectively and pay for through taxes. As Canadians, this idea that we take care of each other and provide health care for all has become one of our defining values. It took more than a hundred years to build our local public hospitals and public health care. Unions, farmers, doctors, nurses, suffragettes, faith communities, and citizens' movements held mass marches and public communities and citizens. They lobbied for it, they voted for it, they pushed for it in every possible way, and ultimately they want it for us. Now it is our turn to stand up to protect our public health care once again. We are not pretending that our public Medicare is perfect. It's not. We need to advocate for it to be better. We need to live up to the promise of health care for all. We need to extend it to cover everyone truly, including immigrants and refugees. and democratic and responsive to our community's unique needs. But all of those things require public health care to be expanded, to be built upon, to be deepened, not dismantled and privatized. I am going to close. I'm going to close with the words of Tommy Douglas, known as the father of Medicare. He was the premier of Saskatchewan during his tenure. He introduced the universal health insurance system that would eventually be adopted across Canada. He said, I'm telling you that unless those of us who believe in Medicare raise our voices in no uncertain terms, unless we arouse our neighbors and our friends and our communities, and we, we are sounding the death knell of Medicare in this country, and I for one will not idly sit by and see that happen.
the stage, and Natalie will introduce the various groups that have come with us today. Natalie. And we have our local health coalitions here. So for those of you here, these are the leaders of some of the local health coalitions from across the province. These people are heroes. They work night and day, they volunteer, they organize their communities, they do public education, they hold rallies. They, I talk to them at 11 o'clock at night, 7 o'clock in the morning, on the weekends. They have shown their dedication through and through, through these very difficult years of the pandemic and the Ford government. And I just want to in, uh, introduce you, um, Owen from uh, Guelph, we have the Toronto Health Coalition, we have Oxford County, we have Sarnia Lambton, we have uh, K uh, Chatham, uh, Walpole Island First Nation and Wallaceburg, we have Northern Ontario, we have uh, Kitchener Waterloo, the struggle to protect our public health care. We are, our struggle is as strong as these people are strong, and everyone matters in this. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Brenda Scott, who's from another coalition. She's from the Gray Bruce Health Coalition, but also the Ch Chesley Citizen Support Group to save their public hospital. I believe your um, mayor, your uh, mayor is here. Okay, and uh, and so Brenda is going to talk. Her hospital emergency department is closed. It's been closed for weeks. It's going to be closed for months. And uh, and she's going to tell us about the small and low hospitals. Go ahead. Hi, is this on? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, before I get started, uh, right into the mic. I am the chair of the uh, small, rural, and local hospitals committee, and I can't tell you how hard these people have worked. They have face the mic. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. I have a little message for Dougie before we get started talking about rural hospitals. That is, hold it up. The power of the people is stronger than the people in power, and that means you, Dougie. It's a, it's a beautiful day out here. What a great day it would be for a resignation. We want accessible health care for everybody in the province, whether you live in a city or a small town or a village, everybody should have it. But some of the rural areas do have some special considerations, and that's why we put this committee together, so that we can get our voice out there. Small rural hospitals, Dougie, are not disposable. They're not uh, uh, part of the system that you can just drop off when you feel like it. The people from Minden are here and they're going to speak after me about what happened to them when their ER was abruptly closed. Um, okay. Um, so, anyways, um, what we're here to talk about are the two issues, centralization and privatization. So I'm from Chesley, Bruce County, cattle country. We know BS when we hear it. We have in our, in our community of Chesley, we have a large number of seniors. Some of them are in the crowd today. I'm sorry we got separated. Oh, hi, hi, guys. <laughs> There's a few of them out there. We also have a large population of Amish and Mennonite um, in our area. And um, so I want to talk about what those people do when there's an emergency. And our ER has been shamefully closed oh, hold on, hold on. since August 30th. And it won't open until October. 
over second. So, you live in a rural area with no public transportation. You can't call Uber, you can't hop a bus, Gus. You just can't do that. So, your only way, if your local ER is closed, you have to drive to another community. And the closest one is about half an hour away. That's, that's a half an hour away if you have a private vehicle. Hey. Sorry, I'm getting... Okay. Um, anyways, um, for people uh, in the Amish community, they use horse and buggy for um, transportation. Getting to the ER is not a 30 minute process for them. They're very worried. This week, um, noting that the ER closures in our four hospital alliance, Three of those hospitals no longer can say they have full-time ER. That's us in Chesley. We're number one, unfortunately. We've had the most ER closures this year. But also in Durham and Clarkton. The mayors of those communities have gathered together and they're asking for a meeting with Doug Ford and Sylvia Jones. Um, good luck to them. I, I hope they get it. Um, and we cert they certainly have all our support. So that's um, pretty much it for Chesley. Um, and I'm going to pass the mic over now to Bonnie Rowe from um, Halliburton Highlands Long-Term Care Committee. Woo! And let's give another shout out to the incredible OHC team, Nellie Mayra and her team. Woo! Okay, so as you can see, residents of Minden are proud to stand here with you all today. Look at everybody! So, this question, as you have done with the Greenbelt decision, Premier Doug Ford, our MPP Lori Scott, and the other MPPs, we wish that you would listen to the thousands of advocates here today. Don't we want them to listen to us? Yes, we do! We need you to reinvest public health care dollars back into our local communities, into home care, long-term care, primary care, and into keeping our hospital doors open, not into for private, for-profit private clinics, not for profit private clinics. Our once perceived crisis is no longer at a crisis stage. It is collapsed. It has collapsed, and we are all here to fight for it. In mid-April, in mid-April of this year, Halliburton County and the village of Minden were devastated to learn that our hospital in Minden would close permanently in six weeks with no community consultation. services Halliburton County, but to the east, west, north, and south. Our next closest hospital is in the village of Halliburton, which is 25 minutes away. And for many, transportation is an issue. They just can't afford a taxi. So we asked the Premier and our MPP, Lori Scott, why was some of the $1 billion surplus in healthcare dollars not used to keep the doors of both of our hospitals open? When staffing levels were at an all-time low after burnout from COVID, and agency staff were being paid double the amount versus the hourly wage of a full-time staff. Why, Lori Scott? Why MPP? Or why uh, Premier? Why were those dollars not used? They're sitting in, they're sitting somewhere doing nothing. Our hospitals such as Minden and others across Ontario, as we've heard about, are not for sale. They were founded, built, and fundraised by communities, for communities. A recent study in Halliburton County in the local newspaper showed that our population had a 2.9% growth over the past five years, which is double the provincial average. This is predicted to continue. People are retiring to Minden. It's beautiful in Halliburton County because of the proximity to hospitals. We need to keep our hospitals open. 
to meet this growth, not boast. In this parliamentary session of the legislature, Ontarians, all of us here today, everyone in this province needs to regain hope and faith and trust in our provincial government. We need to see words turn into actions that show Ontarians you are preserving our health care system. So I'm proud to acknowledge the work of, of all of the residents of Minden who have come here today. And it's my privilege to uh, introduce Patrick Porzichuk, if I can never say it right. <laughs> Sounds good, it works for me. The spokesperson for reopening the Minden ER. And in the words of Tommy Douglas, the greatest way to defend democracy is to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. So here we are in beautiful downtown Toronto, Queen's Park, where all the decisions, all the bills, everything that affects our public health care, it happens right here. We got Doug Ford, who's already screwing us over when it comes to the Green Belt, doing the same to our public health care. Shut down Minden emergency department in six weeks with no public consultation. Back at Ford Fest in June 23rd, Doug Ford met with my daughter who was on my shoulders and said, Kinsley said to Doug, are you going to call my daddy and discuss the mid reopening the Minute ER? Right to my daughter, he says, I will call your father this week and we will work out a plan. <laughs> Doug, it's September, where's my damn phone call? I have another family member who needs to go for a procedure. First thing he's offered, pay $3,500 per leg and we'll fix you up next week. Or you can wait two years in the public sector. We are all here for one reason. That reason is to speak out, speak loudly, stand united. And that's what we're all doing today. I'm already getting the signal from Natalie to keep it down and to speed it up. But the one thing that we have to do as rural Ontario and Ontario as a whole is to keep the fight together, to keep it loud, to keep every single one of you united and never give up the fight. <laughs> Doug Ford, you need to resign. Lori Scott, you're a disgrace to Minden. And all of Kawartha Lakes, Brock and Halliburton, you care more about photo ops with cows than coming to Minden and saying hello and what can be done. So leaving at that, I thank you to the whole group, the whole supporters in yellow. I thank all of Ontario for this fight. I thank Natalie Mera and the OHC and every other union supporter and everybody in this fight together. Let's not stop. Let's get louder. Let's scream. Doug, resign. Doug, resign. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we all thank the people of Minden for standing up the way you did. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And I now want to introduce Helen Lee, granddaughter of the late Fun Heinlum, and chair, former chair of the Family Council of the Manchung Home for the Aged. Please come forward. And before she speaks, if Michelle Jones is in the crowd, please come to the stage. Thank you. Please. I love all your signs. They look beautiful. And I love the noise we're making because Premier Ford needs to hear us. I'm, I'm Helen Lee. I've been asked to talk about long-term care. And it's not pretty, right? But I'll share with you my grandmother's story. This is her, my grandmother, Fun Hei Chu Lam. She lived on her own, in her own home, to the age of 107. She was healthy, mobile, independent, and required no medication. Can you imagine that? She became a justice fighter, social justice fighter, at the age of 70-something, right? So that's great. But my grandmother, in her last days, her life highlighted the plight of seniors in long-term care homes that were broken out in COVID, with shortages of PBE, no staff, no government assistance. She died alone in wave one at the age of 111. She would have made it to 112 had she not gotten COVID and the whole system collapsed. Every 
level of our government was caught unprepared for this pandemic. Ontario has the highest percentage of for-profit homes and the largest number of COVID deaths. Well, of course, privatization of the majority of Ontario's long-term care homes is a policy failure with fatal consequences. We heard about 4,000 people, 5,000 people died. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives says that too. There's an inherent conflict in profit and care. For the profit of poor private operators, they lobbied hard to get less inspections. That's why we had little inspections. And residents, they paid with their lives. The iron ring that you heard about in the media never materialized. There was no consequences for homes that had high levels of death. There weren't. The province now, yes, it's a, it's a very bad shape. The province now has the audacity to move towards privatization of public health care and hospital services, our community hospitals. Are you kidding me? Shame. The government has learned nothing substantive from the pandemic. Nothing substantive. But what I've seen, this is what I've seen, okay? The government strongly favoring privatization, passing far-reaching legislation with no meaningful consultation with the community. And in wave one, they were absent, really. But what did they do? They swiftly passed legislation shielding the for-profit long-term care operators from liability for their negligence in the pandemic. That's what they were busy doing. And they've been busy doing that all along, bulldozing people with legislation without consultation. Some operators you've heard, cited in the military report, they were rewarded with more beds and 25-year-old licenses, right? That's a shame. You know what the Ontario Ombudsman said in his report recently? Where licenses should have been revoked, lower level enforcement actions were granted. There were lapses in oversight, lapses in oversight. The new Long-Term Care Act, it enshrined for-profit care in it, and it removed a requirement for home operators with terrible records to be barred from receiving new licenses. Can you imagine that? Yes, yes, it's the death of our nation, it's the death of Ontario, really. And during the public inquiries, these are public inquiries, okay? The government learned to withhold documents until last minute. So the COVID Commission, they never got a lot of their documents until the end. So how could they have all that time to review it when their report was due? And the Ontario Obispin, he noted, it's difficult to confirm whether the ministry provide us with all the relevant documentation. Serious transparency and accountability issues with this government. So I'm gonna end by saying this. What happened in long-term care should be a warning. It should be a cautionary tale. <laughs> Profits over care is deadly. <laughs> and we're here today to say we want to protect and build up our public hospitals. Keep your hands off our public hospitals, Premier Ford. Fund them properly. Treat their staff well. And I'm also here to say we, we want to remind this government, and you can hear me now, that under your watch, Thousands of our beloved seniors perish, my grandmother included, and we have not forgotten them. I miss her dearly every day. Their deaths must be a lightning rod for us to make substantive changes in long-term care and in health care. We will fight till we win. Ellen, thank you so much. That was just a moving tribute, not only to your grandmother, but to you yourself and all the people who've come out today and are fighting across this province. And all the deaths that we mourn today. But as they say, we mourn, but we organize. Their deaths will not be in vain. Not in vain. And I want to introduce now Natalie Mara. She will be winding up this wonderful rally today, and she will thank you for all the efforts you're making. Please welcome Natalie Mara. I don't want to even delay us for one minute here. I'm just honored today to be on the stage to end this with the people from the health coalitions across the province with Ellen and the children.
children of long-term care whose parents died. Um, and Helen is going to lay a wreath before we leave in front of the legislature in memory of the more than 5,000 people who died, the majority of them in for-profit long-term care homes. They died of a preventable illness that should never have been allowed to spread through the homes in the way that it did. And they died in conditions that would just make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And that's what we're here for. It's about people. At the end of the day, if you believe in public health care, it's because you believe in equity and compassion. Because you want to put people first before profit. And today we had, I think, I don't know, the lawn was full. I mean, if we were there to the back, I'm thinking 8,000 people, I'm not sure. They're saying 10 to 12,000 people. And when we come back, don't we all know five more people we could bring out? Let's bring 50,000 next time. Goodbye, thank you.